Welcome to the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast, the official podcast of Ryan Johnson Ministries. This podcast was created for the purpose of equipping others for the advancement of the kingdom of God. We hope that you enjoy this episode and encourage you to subscribe to the Blacksmith Chronicles today. For more information about Ryan Johnson Ministries, please visit www.ryanjohnson.us or email us directly at info at ryanjohnson.us. Hey guys, welcome to the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast. This week, I have the privilege and the honor to welcome a guest that I have known of and followed for some time. We have mutual friends that we know, but I've never had the privilege of sitting down and having a conversation until this moment. And it's a huge honor for me. And yes, I'm very excited to have this week's guest for the episode as he is a man with a great deal of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding on multiple levels, including revival, uh, Jewish customs and history, along with where we are as a nation in this hour. So without further ado, I want to welcome this week's guest, Dr. Michael Brown. Dr. Brown, thank you so much for joining the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast. It's my joy to be with you. All right. So for those that may not be familiar with Dr. Brown, are you living underneath the rock? I just, I, I don't know. <laughs> you don't know this man of God, but for those that doesn't know who you are, can you give us just a, a, a highlight of who you are, what you do, family life or whatever? Sure. I'm a Jewish believer in Jesus, born in 1955, came to faith in 1971 as a heroin shooting, LSD using hippie rock drummer. Uh, God wonderfully transformed my life. And when my dad said, Michael, it's great you're off drugs, but we're Jews. We don't believe this. He asked me to meet the local rabbi, and that led to the rabbi saying, you don't even know Hebrew. How can you talk to us? So that led to some of my academic studies, which culminated in a doctorate in Semitic languages from New York University. So everything we do, we seek to undergird with, with biblical truth. But my, my burden over the years is expressed really in, in three R's, a revival, burning to see revival in the church, revolution meaning a gospel-based moral and cultural revolution that would sweep the nation, and redemption meaning redemption of the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So our ministry, Ask Dr. Brown, hits on all those aspects really every day. Uh, I do a daily live radio show called The Line of Fire, which we also air on video and live stream on Facebook and YouTube. I've had the privilege of preaching around the world and uh, leading schools where we've raised up leaders that are now serving on the mission field all around the world. And then I pretty much write day and night. So I've uh, written a little bit over 40 books and normally write five op-ed pieces a week trying to address the key things happening in the culture around us from a, a biblically-based perspective. And my wife, Nancy, came to faith as an, a Jewish atheist at the age of 19 in 1974 We've been married since 76 and have uh, two kids and four grandkids. Come on now. That's so awesome. Yeah, I, I don't know who's in the lead now. Is it you or Jennifer LeClaire who has the most books out right now? Because you guys are just putting books out every week, it seems like. <laughs> well, don't, don't know. I haven't, haven't followed. But the goal, hey, look, you got a burden to get a message out, it just comes flowing out, you know. That's right. I'm, I'm a huge fan of the book, so I, I love it. But... Let me ask you this, because of your background, uh, being born a natural Jew, why is it so important for you now, all these years of being a follower of Christ, why is it so important for you to teach Christians the importance of Jewish history and how that applies to Christianity right now? Yeah, there are a few reasons. First, the, the Bible is, is a Jewish Bible. And the writers of almost all of the Bible, with the exception of one or two, themselves were, were Jews. And the Messiah of Israel himself is a Jew, and he'll return as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and he'll return to Jerusalem. So you, you, can't, you can't get away from the Jewish roots and the Jewish future. And it doesn't mean that when Gentiles come to faith, they become Jews. Quite the contrary, we each bring our, our own dynamic of, of differences that, that become a beautiful symphony and, and harmony together in the Lord. There's uh, unity in our diversity, but undeniably this is a, a Jewish story. That's, that's one thing. 
A second thing is that Paul wrote to the Romans in Romans 11, to the Gentile believers there, that their, their calling was to provoke Israel to envy, to provoke the Jewish people to envy. Uh, and sadly, through much of church history, uh, the church has pushed Jewish people away one of the biggest obstacles to sharing the gospel of Jesus with a Jewish person, especially a religious Jew or someone in Israel, is, is the history of Christianity. And, and if there's anyone on the earth that there sure is not the Messiah, it would be him because of the way the church has often represented him. So it's important to, to call the church to have a heart for Israel and out of that heart to, uh, to then be burdened in outreach and through living a godly life to provoke Jewish people to, to envy. And then just in our, our wider understanding, in terms of context, in terms of history, in terms of background, that often it's important to put things in a right historical context. Look, when you're, you're reading Paul's letter to the Corinthians, you want to understand more about Corinthian culture, the ancient Greek world, try to put things in that, in that context. When you're reading the book of Revelation, you want to understand what apocalyptic literature is, what the symbolism means, how this would have been understood in the ancient world. Well, again, so much of the Bible is on Jewish soil. You know, you're, you're reading the Sermon on the Mount and things like that. It's, it's really helpful to understand these things. So there, there are many different reasons why this remains a great burden. And lastly, there's an ominous rise of, of anti-Semitism in the world today, uh, including in the church, even in evangelical circles. So it's essential that we confront it, expose it, uproot it, and work together for the salvation of the Jewish people. I'm originally born and raised out of Northeast Alabama. I currently live in the Great Smoky Mountains of Tennessee now, but I was on staff at a church not too far from uh, Washington, D.C. so many years ago. And I was really taken aback at the moment that we had a Messianic rabbi come in and teach and minister at the church. And the opposition that he got from members of the church that were very anti anything Jew. And so wow. when you, when you, when you combine that, mm. you know, for, for this Alabama boy in where I'm originally from, there aren't hardly any, if at all Jews in that region. So it's a little bit of a shell shock stage. So I imagine there's, there's probably many people that are not accustomed when you talk about, people having that animosity against Jewish people. When we look at the news now, we can see that in an understanding of, of what's happening with black and African Americans. But we also see this same similar thing, not measuring them to be equal, but we see this towards Jewish people and especially from the church. Why is it that Jews still seem like a big enemy to so many people in our day? Yeah, in, in my book, Our Hands Are Stained with Blood, I have a whole chapter dealing with the diabolical nature of anti-Semitism. And I've even given lectures on it on college campuses, university campuses, and fielded uh, objections to my thesis, and, and no one was able to, to disrupt it or disprove it. But the bottom line is Satan wants to wipe out the Jewish people. There, there is not a rational, logical explanation that connects all the dots through history. See, someone might say, well, look, the Jews have so much power, the Jews control the banks, the Jews control the media, which of course are exaggerated statements. But if you look in America, Jewish influence on media, on banking, different things is dis disproportionate to our percentage of the population. But that's hardly the norm worldwide. And it's hardly been the norm through history, where often we've been the tail and not the head and we've had very little influence in society because we've been marginalized and still we've been hated. When we're secular, secular Israelis are targeted by terrorists. Uh, when we're religious, everyone thinks we're, we're different. And, you know, it, there was the old idea that the reason that men wore a head covering Jewish men was that it was to cover the horns on their head. I mean, people actually believe this stuff. Um, to this day, there are parts of the world, especially the Muslim world, that believe that the Passover Seder when that's eaten, the Passover meal, the unleavened bread, that Jews have kidnapped and killed, uh, used to be a Christian child, now it can be a Muslim child, but use their blood and, and mix that in with the Passover month. So wow. people still believe this. The level of irrational lies is extraordinary. So on the one hand, had the nation of Israel walked in obedience to God, embraced the Messiah, 
then we would have been under great blessing and would not have fallen under divine judgment. We rejected the Torah, the prophets, the Messiah over the centuries. Because of that, we've received divine judgment. We've been scattered. So we don't deny that. We recognize that there has been divine judgment in our history. But on the other hand, the nature of the hatred, the nature of the lies, the disproportionate amount of it, the fact that it continues around the world to this day and intensifies. It's at the same levels now that it was before the Holocaust in much of the world. The only difference now is that we have the modern state of Israel as, as, as a place to, to live in security. So the, the answer is the enemy, Satan, wants to wipe out the Jewish people. And ultimately, a Jewish Jerusalem must welcome the Messiah back Ultimately, God promised that no matter what happens to the Jewish people, he would preserve us as a people. So Satan's got his, his um, target on us, on our back, for those very reasons. If he can wipe us out, he destroys God's promises, his integrity, and thwarts the return of the Messiah. Plus, just as Christians are hated because we are uniquely identified with Jesus around the world, so Satan hates Jesus and therefore hates us. So the Jewish people chosen by God for a purpose are singled out for special hatred by Satan. It's interesting because I'm, um, I'm, a, I'm very, there's two things I believe that are crossing the line of heresy for me. One is for anyone to say that Jesus didn't physically raise from the dead. If you, if you preach anything else to me, that's heresy. The other side is what is growing popularity is replacement theology. The idea that, Israel is not important. Israel is not needed. And the church has ultimately replaced Israel. And I'm alarmed for two reasons of this is one, I run into a lot of Christians that have bought into this and they're very pro-Palestine and just totally take away Israel. The, the, the answer to all things is get rid of Israel and make it Palestine. The other side of it is I run into a lot of people that have no concept of this because they don't really pay attention to Israel and they don't have a heart for Israel because we're, or I'm so pro Israel, it always has my attention. So how, how is it that as Christians, especially in America, American Christians, why is it so important to know the dangers of taking on a thought process of anything anti-Israel and not having the heart for clearly the apple of God's eye. Right. So Paul warns in Romans 11 to the Gentile believers, warns them not to become arrogant based on ignorance. <clears throat> the ignorance was well, God is finished with the Jewish people. God has cast Israel off. And the Gentile Christians have now taken Israel's place in God's economy. So God's finished with them, and we're the new kids on the block. And Paul said, don't be arrogant, but, but walk in godly fear, <clears throat> because you can be cut off just the same way, and they can be grafted back in. <clears throat> so the long and short of it is that the, the era of replacement theology was based on the wrong idea that God was through with Israel as a people and a nation, that the promises no longer applied to them, that individual Jews can be saved, but everything that God promised to the nation of Israel in the Old Testament was now applied to the church in the New Testament. And uh, because, because of that, uh, the idea of Jewish people suffering, Jewish people being punished, scattered around the world, the theology was even developed that said that, that the church should see that as, as God's righteous hand. In other words, as the church prospers and the Jewish people suffer, that's all just the, the, the truths of the gospel playing out. You can see how dangerous that type of thinking could be. And, and then the, the producing of a spiritual pride, not recognizing that we all stand by grace and faith. And to be pro-Israel does not mean anti-Palestinian. Uh, to be pro-Israel means to be pro-God's best for everyone in the Middle East. But if, if you don't recognize that God sovereignly reestablished the modern state of Israel out of the ashes of the Holocaust, against all odds and against all logical probability, he brought it to pass, as he said, then you're, you're missing one of the great acts of God in, in modern history. 
you're also missing why there's such controversy over Jerusalem, because that's, that's the, ultimately the, the place to which the Messiah will return when welcomed back by his Jewish people. So if, if the church has now displaced Israel in God's plan of salvation, and there's nothing that remains for the, the nation, then why is the Messiah coming back to Jerusalem? Why must his Jewish people welcome him back? Why are there key passages like Zechariah 12 and Zechariah 14 that talk about all nations coming up against Jerusalem and then God fighting for his people and the Lord himself coming to establish his kingdom? We, we deny the, the little truth of so much of the Bible when we do this. And uh, a short answer that really sums everything up uh, is from Derek Prince. I was doing a meeting for his, his son-in-law, uh, Peter Wins, a few months ago. And Peter made the comment that his grandfather, Derek Prince, said that, that Israel is like the top button on the shirt. And when you button that wrong, all the other buttons are off. And sometimes you don't realize it until you get to the end, until you step back from the mirror. It's like, oh. So we got to rebutton, get Israel in the right place. Everything else will fall into place. I like that. Huge fan of Derek Prince, too. So... Uh, how big of a, really and truthfully, how big of a monumental moment was it when President Trump uh, opened up the embassy there in Jerusalem? What does that mean for this nation and Israel? It was a tremendously significant moment on many fronts. Uh, first, let's just understand the basic issue, that every sovereign nation in the world declares what its capital city is, where the embassies will be, et cetera, and everyone else accepts that. There is no other capital city on the planet in any nation that is, is not recognized by other nations. That's just the way things work. Our capital is in Washington, D.C. That's where it is. You can go there and there's a place that's nicknamed Embassy Row because you, you drive through the neighborhood in D.C. and there are all the different embassies for all the different nations and the diplomats living there and things like that. So Israel, early on in its history, said Jerusalem is our capital. It's always been the, the capital of Israel for, for 3,000 years since the days of, of David. Uh, we've had it on our books as law to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, beginning in the days of President Clinton. And there was a clause that there could be a six-month delay in, in moving the embassy and doing everything that had to be done. So the, the clause just, okay, we'll delay it six months, we'll delay it six months. Bill Clinton did that. George Bush did that for eight years. Barack Obama did that for eight years. Everyone says they're going to move the embassy. When Trump said it, people started to panic and say, well, he really means it. Because if you move the embassy, that's going to be like World War III. If you move the embassy, then the Middle East is going to go up in flames. If you move the embassy, then any chance for peace with Palestinians and surrounding Arab nations is out the door. If you remove the embassy, Americans will be attacked. Or you move the embassy, Americans will be attacked around the world. Well, he did it. And what happened? We now have a new peace treaty, unprecedented with two nations at the same time, United Arab Emirates and Bahrain. This never happened before. The previous treaties were in 1979 with Egypt, 1995 with Jordan. So that's two treaties in over 70 years, suddenly two in a, in a day, uh, you know, a treaty and, a, and an arrangement. So it's, it's mind-boggling to see what's happened. It, it, is, it is telling Israel, this is your country, and we recognize this is your capital. And it is, in a sense, setting the stage for the Messiah's return to this place. And I believe that it's something that brings divine favor on America in doing it. Uh, we shall see what happens with the November elections. I'm not making a prediction. But just from my own vantage point, uh, had Trump failed to keep his promise here, I would, I would be less optimistic of his chances for re-election. I know that's one thing among many, but it is one important thing. The fact that he did it makes me wonder if that will bring him additional divine favor when he really needs it to get in. Again, it's not the only factor. It's one of many issues, but it is of great significance. And obviously, President Trump is a very polarizing uh, individual in our time, and it'll be interesting to see how history portrays this man uh, before he was ever 
in a political realm of any form or fashion. It seemed like everybody loved him, and now everybody despises the man. It's, it, it seems as though he can genuinely do no uh, right with certain individuals and stuff, but you do, you do have to, I believe, you do have to respect one thing. If he says he's going to do it, he's a man of his word in order to see something through. And this is something that's very significant, whereas politics in times past will usually create a lot of broken promises. And you have President Trump, who has a history of business. He's a businessman, but he's a very volatile person with his words. We know that. It, it, it's really hard to get people to uh, – it, It's you'll find people that either really, really love President Trump or really, really, really not like President Trump. In saying all that, do you believe that what his ability to push forward with what he says he's going to do, it is a reason that we need a man such as his leadership to go through with his promises for this hour and not so much one that will promise and break and promise and break and promise and break? Right. So, so Trump is a unique human being in, in our history. Uh, someone that none of us would have taken seriously as a political candidate in the past. Uh, there was actually a couple, a Canadian couple that was held hostage by Islamic terrorists in Pakistan for a number of years. And they were completely cut off from the outside world. And at one point their captors told them that Trump had become president of the United States. And the, the gentleman said it never entered his mind to take it seriously. He thought that they were just, playing games with them. I mean, that's how impossible the scenario was. And yet for him to be the strongest pro-life leader we've had, for him to be the one to move the embassy to Jerusalem, for him to be standing up for religious freedoms like no one has before, and facing down the tyranny of China and speaking up for other religious minorities, it's, um, it's mind-boggling to see. And at the same time, the way he conducts himself is anything but Christian. And the nastiness and being thin-skinned and juvenile and stretching the truth and, and so on and so forth. You know, just when you're cheering him on for something <laughs> great that he does, you think, oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> and, and it's true. So, so, you know, as I've said, he's, he's like a human bulldozer and uh, he gets a lot of good done, but with a lot of collateral damage. You know, wrecking ball is great for destroying the system. You know, knocking down the things that need to be taken out. Wrecking ball is not good for renovating a room. But what you have with Trump is kind of a human wrecking ball as well. So I believe that a man of his uh, incredible fortitude, a certain stubbornness that is just not moved. I mean, I mean he, he lives for conflict. He lives for the storm. Someone said that he gets up every morning and says, what can I disrupt? <laughs> you know, I, I talk about this at, at length in, in my book, Evangelicals at the Crossroads, where we passed the Trump test, my latest book that just came out. It's, it's, uh, it's critical that we understand who the man is with his strengths and his weaknesses. And as followers of Jesus, that we don't defend the weaknesses, that we don't become apologists for Trump. As I tweeted the other day, I, I preached Christ crucified and resurrected, not Trump elected and reelected, that, that my message is, is Jesus. At the same time, uh, among available people right now, uh, in terms of, of having that forehead of steel, being that human bulldozer, Trump is uniquely equipped. And with all his character failings, you mentioned the fact that he's kept his word tenaciously. Dennis Prager said that's how he judges character, and Trump has excelled there. I was reading earlier this week Psalm 15, Psalm 24, about the one that can uh, ascend the hill of the Lord and, and dwell in God's holy presence. And, and one of the characteristics is that they make an oath and they keep it even to their hurt. If they say it, they do it. And during the primaries, I mean, it was obvious to me we couldn't take Trump seriously. And, you know, it is interesting, as you mentioned, he was, he was very popular with the Hollywood circles when it was, you know, Apprentice, Celebrity Apprentice, and he's the playboy guy on, you know, Howard Stern and all that. The left loved him. He was a jerk in certain ways then. He's the same person now, except changed his, 
his uh, political and cultural views, <laughs> and suddenly he's the enemy. But you know, when when uh, when it was during the primaries, I thought he's just using evangelicals. How stupid can we be? He's going to get us to the table and give us all these promises and woo us over, win us over. And the next thing we vote for him, he gets elected and he'll throw us under the bus. Well, quite the contrary. Uh, he's more surrounded now by evangelicals than ever. He continues to listen to them. Uh, James Robinson is a dear, dear friend of mine, and, and he has direct access to the president. And he has told me about times when he spoke to him very firmly. When, when you know, one time he, he rebuked him so strongly, he had a call back afterwards to, to apologize for speaking so strongly. And Trump's response is, man, I love you. I really love you. So he hasn't cut us off. You know, when we have these, these, these terrible race challenges in America right now, he's surrounded himself by, by black leaders and Hispanic leaders and others and said, let's talk, let's understand. So uh, I see this as tremendously significant. He has kept his word. And when I was talking to Eric Metaxas, who's famous for his uh, biography of Bonhoeffer and more recently Luther, you know, we were talking about Martin Luther comparing him to Trump. And he said, you know, Martin Luther was like Donald Trump on steroids. And it does give you a, a good picture because Luther was a world changer. Luther had the courage to take on the church of his day, which is really the culture of Europe. I cannot imagine with all the controversy I'm in and the attack that I come under day and night and criticism I face, I can't imagine what it was like to be in his shoes. What type of human being could be that strong to take on the, the culture and the church of his day? And yet that human bulldozer that was Martin Luther had many areas of his life that were not crucified in Christ-like because of which there was tremendous collateral damage. So, that's why we, we have to do our best to keep praying for the president, speaking into the president's life, uh, doing our best not to justify his wrongful behavior, but absolutely appreciating the good that he does. That's why, for me, it's a, for me, it's a no-brainer to vote for him in November. How do you um, respond to Christians in America that... Uh, let's face it, we have two candidates that we're looking at with this upcoming election, and that is uh, former Vice President Joe Biden with his running mate Kamala Harris, and you have current sitting President, President Trump, and Vice President Mike Pence. That's our only two options. But I hear so many Christians that are so put off with the demeanor or the words, the tweets of President Trump. And they have bought into some of the, uh, I would say, false ac accusations and slander mm -hmm. of the media. And they're very anti-voting, period. They're, 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 I hear them say, I'm not voting for either one because I can't choose, quote unquote, a lesser of the two evils in good consciousness. So I'm just not going to vote. How do you respond to those kind of American Christians in getting them to understand that voting is a first and foremost a right and it's an essential for uh the church and this nation in this hour right so first i respect everyone's conscience before the lord they have to settle this between them and god and there are times when we have to sit out elections years ago uh, a friend of mine in louisiana who didn't really believe in voting at all for his various Christian reasons, we were talking about things. And he said, okay, well, what do I do right now? The race for governor is this one guy previously jailed for corruption charges. As far as I know, he's still corrupt. And the other guy was the former grand wizard of the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Who do I vote for? It's like, okay, there may be times when you sit out an election. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I understand that. But what I would present, and again, I'd, I'd urge everyone to read Evangelicals at the Crossroads because I lay out the case for and the case against Trump and, and then ultimately call us to unite around Jesus, even if we differ over Trump. But I would just ask this. Let's say from God's perspective, what's, what's the number one, number two, number three biggest issue in his sight? You know, in the days of slavery, we would all say, you know, looking back, slavery, number one. So to me, the number one issue is, is the shedding of innocent blood, the, the slaughter of the unborn, which even though numbers are like half of what they were 
10 or 20 years ago, we're still talking maybe 700,000 babies slaughtered a year. I mean, her horrific numbers. And, and then, uh, to me, uh, another massive issue, I believe important in God's side also, is, is the issue of, of freedom of religion. And, and then uh, standing with Israel and standing against international terror. And then the, the, the family and the wholeness of, of family life, which, which means dealing with LGBTQ extremism. And, and where that's going. So I just ask you, okay, look at the platforms and, and look at the candidates. And do you think it's more important that I vote for someone that's going to, to fight against the slaughter of the unborn, but be nasty and mean spirited in other ways, or that I vote for someone that may not be as outwardly nasty and mean spirited, but is going to solidify uh, the, the slaughter of the unborn as, as a constitutional right. I just go down the list. You know, uh, if our, our, our grandchildren now, we have four between 13 and 19, right? So very easy for me to be thinking about the world that their kids grow up in. So if they grow up without religious freedoms, do I tell them, what, you see what actually happened, the guy that was really fighting for our freedoms, even with the Department of Justice, pushing back against discrimination against Christians in America. But he is like, his tweets were nasty. And so I didn't vote for him. <laughs> I mean, how would that play out? Or if you think of a baby is saved as we continue to move in a more pro-life direction in America and Trump helps with that. Remember, it's not just Supreme Court appointees, but hundreds of other justices and 99% of all major cases never make it to the Supreme Court. So they're getting decided in courts where they're Trump appointees have transformed the, the nature of things. It's four more years. We're trying a total transformation of our courts that could last a generation or two. So you think if an unborn baby is saved uh, because of, of Trump's presidency and justice is appointed and a more pro-life movement in America, do you think that baby would, that person would grow up saying, yeah, well, I, I wish you never voted for him because some of his tweets, you know, he called people dogs and that was just nasty. Uh, the, the people in Hong Kong, the protesters that Trump stood up for, uh, the, the Muslim minority in China uh, and other persecuted Christians in China that Trump has, has stood up for. Do you think they're saying, uh, you know, he's just, he, he lies a lot. The man lies a lot. So I'm not denying the faults, the weaknesses. I do believe that there's collateral damage with it, but I have to weigh things out. Now, to be honest, if in my mind the damage was just as great as, as, the, as the benefit, then I might just cast a third party vote as, as a, a statement of conscience. But I don't see it like that at all. I see it right now as basically a vote for Trump versus mobocracy, a vote for Trump versus social anarchy and socialism, a vote for Trump or a loss of freedoms and, and the deepening of, of our attack on the unborn and the advancing of radical trans activism and, and on and on it goes and the weakening of our stance against international terror. So the collateral damage to me is there, but it's much more minor. And, and to me, that's something that we can work against by, by not defending the president's wrongful behavior, but by modeling righteous behavior ourselves and saying, here, we voted for him for these reasons. But boy, we don't like that and agree with that. So let's reach out and have a, a friendly conversation. That we can help fix. The other stuff you really can't fix when you lose your liberties, when the unborn are slaughtered, when, you know, those are existential things you really can't undo. I, I do believe strongly that we're in an hour that um, I would have never imagined we're having to fight off the threat of socialism as we are. Uh, and unfortunately, because of the way things are, I hear Christians who are in favor of socialism. And I know from reading years and years of your articles and books that you're an advocate of all things Bible. What does mm -hmm. the Bible actually say? So here, in, in, you mentioned socialism, and so my mind goes, is socialism biblical? Yeah, so the long and short of it is, is no. And it's not socialism versus capitalism. That's what we have to understand. We're not just talking about an economic system. We're talking about a spiritual mindset. 
that when you look at socialism in its origins, when you, when you go back to, to Engel and Marx, there was a fundamental anti-God, anti-religion element with it. Socialism is not just an economic system of sharing the wealth in a somewhat forced way and kind of leveling everything out. Okay, you have more money than I do, let's level that out. Uh, you know, no one will own personal property, just be all owned by the state. It's more than that. Socialism is basically looking for a utopia, a certain heaven on earth of perfect equality and mutual sharing. And because that is not human nature, it will therefore make this happen. And in the midst of this, faith in God, recognition of fallen humanity, in the, in the midst of the socialist utopia, a religion, and specifically the Bible, and faith in Jesus, these things become enemies, which is why as socialism rises in, it, in its fullest form, and we're not just talking about the, the way that you have certain socialist medical practices and things like that in certain small European countries, but when socialism really raises its head, as it did, say, in, in communist Russia or in communist China uh, or in other countries, it comes with a direct anti-God antichrist spirit and that's why we reject it it is not just an economic mindset and which is better capitalism or socialism it is a spiritual mindset and one that seeks to play take the place of god and his kingdom and one that is always doomed to failure and one that produces massive suffering in the process we're a generation right now that is in the midst of turmoil yet again. I mean, we have, um, you know, the reality of cases where racism has definitely been evident. Then we have the cases where it has been an assumption of racism or it has been uh, the loss of life because of authentic Bruce, uh, police brutality or people taking it on their own hands to take out the life of police. It, there's a civil unrest without a doubt. And it, 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 there's definitely not a single answer that we can point to other than, Hey, you know, we could go simply and say, God is the answer, Christ, the son and Holy spirit, of course. But what are the, what are some of the necessary steps that you feel like is very important to get this current generation, this current culture to understand some of the real threats of trying to bring about that utopia for the sake of making everything one thing and stripping out values and rights and so on and so forth. What we have to do is, is engage the culture in a holistic way. And we have to recognize that, that although there is a fleshly manifestation of rioting and looting and anarchy and violence, that many are, are grieved over what they perceive as a lack of justice, that many are grieved over how they see the underdog mistreated. And we need to appeal to that sense of justice. We need to appeal to that longing for righteousness. Uh, even a young person that has a problem with the church because the church mistreats gays. And in their mind, you know, Billy and Bobby are really nice guys. And, you know, why, why don't we recognize the legitimacy of their marriage? And there's something in that young person's concern that's a righteous concern that it seems like nice people are being excluded by the strict rules of the church. So rather than just throwing that person out as, as, as a, a sinner, we want to also start with where they are and say, you know, God does care about justice, and God really wants what's best for human thriving, that we have to insert ourselves right in the middle of the conversation and say, but it won't work this way or this way or this way. The only way it's going to work is if we God's people take hold of, of the truth of the gospel, which has answers for every area of life, and that God does have a better way for racial reconciliation, and God does have a better way for biblical justice. And, and let's model that in our own communities. Let's be those that love one another. I mean, that's the ultimate thing that, that people are longing for and looking for is, is, is love and being part of something authentic. Let's show them 
that this is not just a matter of you pray the prayer, you get forgiveness, and you go to heaven. This is a matter of getting freed from the bondage and tyranny of sin so that we can now live for God and serve God, the God who created us, put us in this world, is the God who knows what's best for human flourishing. Let's demonstrate that through our families, through our individual lives, through our social structures that we build, through our church communities. Let's model that for the world to see. Do you personally feel like there's something in this hour that the church could possibly be doing better to help with the racial reconciliation? Uh, yes, ab absolutely. Um, for, for, ex for example, uh, to, to talk about issues openly and honestly rather than take sides. This, I'm going to list a few things, but that's the first to do. It's like, okay, rather than just react, well, there is no police brutality. How can you know there's a, a systemic racism and you start yelling at each other? First thing is, hey, how did you see what happened with Breonna Taylor and the, the grand jury verdict? How did you understand what, what happened with, with uh, this shooting or that shooting or you know, with George Floyd or with this one or that one? And, and what's your perspective? Because the first thing is we find out we come from different backgrounds. We've lived in different worlds, even here in America. And we are, we're completely ignorant of someone else's life experience. If you remember the OJ trial, when he was acquitted, white Americans were outraged. How could this be? Black Americans were, at last, someone gets justice. And white Americans said, oh, justice? What are you talking about? The evidence was there, the DNA, everything, without question. Black Americans said, well, you can't trust the police. They may have planted stuff. You think, was it that one group is smart, the other group is ignorant? Or is it different life experiences and backgrounds? So you sit down and talk, start there. Uh, I am constantly in the midst of having difficult conversations. It's um, right now as we're, as we're doing this, it's, it's Thursday, September 24th. I spent a lot of time last night trying to research as accurately as I could the facts around the shooting of Breonna Taylor, and then posted an article going through each side. Can you fault the police? Can you fault Kenneth Walker, her boyfriend that shot? Can you fault this one? Can you fault that one? How should we respond? Now, the moment I do that, I'm going to get hit from all sides, but yeah. that's okay because we've got to put the issues out. So let's have the conversation. That's the first thing. The second thing, let's not just react against the extremes of the BLM movement, which I separate from the concept that Black Lives Matter. Let's not just react to their extremes. Let's not just react to the, to the protests and, and especially to the riots. Let's raise our voices, not to, to prove how woke we are, but let's raise our voices to help lead the way in saying we are all about racial reconciliation. And when there's injustice, we will stand up to it. So we, we raise our voices so we're, we're heard in that regard. And, and the other thing is what some of my friends and colleagues are doing is they're going right into the midst of the hottest, worst areas with worship teams, with evangelism teams, and lifting up Jesus and preaching the gospel and shining like lights in the midst of very dark places. And it's interesting you bring that up because I've seen recently, of course, um, a lot of that has been happening in different locations, of course, but one well-known artist uh, recently was their sound equipment and instruments was confiscated by the police and they weren't able to uh, quote unquote protest in their worship because everything was confiscated. So they went walking and, you know, definitely not uh, riding in the sense of riding, but they went walking and they began to lift up praises just with their voices, you know, no instruments or thing because the police done that. So, even in that, we still get the glimpses of not persecution that you typically think of, like when the Christians were lined up at the beach and they were beheaded, but there's definitely persecution taking place against the church in this hour. It, 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 it's, it's amazing to me, though, how I'm seeing such a difficult acceptance to that where the church you take someone like pastor john MacArthur, who you know you and i both are going to disagree on a lot of things but he's fighting to keep his church open but you have so many in the body of christ that are against him open the church 
And it, it, it's like this failed acknowledgement that where we're at as a culture, especially in this nation, we have the roots of persecution against the body, against the church, uh, taking its root in that. Is it necessary for us to really pay attention to that? Or is it necessary for us to go, yeah, it's really not a big deal? So two separate issues. The question of Pastor MacArthur and others who are defying government orders and opening their church buildings, and the question of, of the larger persecution of believers in America. So let me start with the second. There's no question that that's been rising for years. Hostility towards the gospel, uh, it could come in terms of uh, LGBT extremism, where if you hold to a different point of view in, in your place of business, or things like that, that, that you get discriminated against. This has been happening for years. I have friends that literally lost their jobs uh, over, over their stand, their private stand on, on these issues. Uh, we've, we've had an increasing attack on our freedoms, and you can see it now clearly manifest with COVID-19 issues. Uh, so for example, in the state of Nevada, if you have a casino, you can operate that at 50% capacity. If you have a church building that seats 3,000, you can only put 50 people in. If you're in California, you can march down the streets in the hundreds or thousands and, and, and protest the, the latest police shooting. But if you gather in your buildings uh, to worship the Lord, you can't sing or you can't have a home Bible study. So this is outrageous and it needs to be recognized. Uh, we are not like Chicken Little saying the sky is falling. There is legitimate, ongoing discrimination against believers as believers here in America. It needs to be recognized. Thankfully, President Trump is standing for us. Thankfully, the Department of Justice is standing for us. But these are uh, undeniable issues, and we must stand up and speak out. The more we are silent, the harder it's going to be when more and more rights are taken away. When it comes to COVID-19 decisions, every pastor, every church has to work that out between them and God. Uh, I was interacting with Andy Stanley about this because I wrote an article saying I respect John MacArthur refusing to comply with government orders, and I respect Andy Stanley for complying. And in Andy's view, look, you have mayors, governors trying to figure this out, trying to do the best thing, trying to coordinate you know, you got sports shut down, no stadiums, you know, they're all empty. And hey, the least he can do is work together with the authorities. And we gather together in a thousand different ways. It doesn't have to be just in one big meeting together. So in his way, that's how we model our Christian witness, honoring the authorities and, and being the church in many other ways. From Pastor MacArthur's perspective, there is a gross overreach of the government. There are double standards. There is a, a direct attack on the church, and that must be resisted, and therefore you stand. So each one has to work that out, but uh, it's also different from place to place. So the state of things in California is different than other parts of the country, and it makes a lot more sense in California to say, hey, we're gonna go on meeting. The one caution I'd have though, and I address uh, all of this in my book, When the World Stops, which was written to address issues in the midst of the virus a few months back, the one question I have in all of this is that the big goal is not just that we go on with large meetings and church buildings. The big goal is that we be the church, yeah. that, we, that we recognize that we must live differently in the midst of this society, that more of the same is not the goal. So when COVID-19 is done, the goal is not just that everything goes back to normal. We need a new normal that is much more like the biblical normal. Yeah, definitely, because regions is going to be a big factor in this. I, the thing that just it, it grieves my heart is when you have, um, which I've said from the beginning, I, I believe it's that pastor or that apostle, whoever's of that congregation, that decision is, is, is not my decision. So that's between them and God there to pray about it. But what really just grieves me is this these different individuals that, will renounce one or the other because based off of the decision that they make, they deem the opposite of that as being yeah. completely wrong. Yeah. And we really had to be careful about this because uh, there's, there's a realistic side to like you're saying, the relig the region side that's connected with it and stuff and everything. So it's definitely a fascinating time to be alive. <laughs> I think you can be challenged one way or the other, but 
How is it that people can get connected with you the easiest? You have over 40 books, you know, of course, all that's probably on Amazon, but how can they get with you directly? Yeah, so the easiest thing is to just go to my website, askdrbrown.org, A-S-K-D-R-Brown.org. When you go there, you'll see icons to connect with us on Facebook. We are super active there, super active uh, on, on Twitter, on YouTube. So connect with us via whatever social media you use. Uh, every day on the website, boom, three in the afternoon, Eastern time, the link goes up. You can watch our, our daily radio show, The Line of Fire. You can get it on podcast. Every time I write a new article, we post it there. So askdrbrown.org is the place to go. And from there, you can connect with us on social media. We have an archive of thousands of articles, thousands of, of radio shows, videos that are available to search for. And then uh, uh, resources, our books are available. You can purchase them and, and our other materials. We have a whole online school as well. So ask Dr. Brown, ASK. DRBrown.org. Now, I may have asked everything right here, but I want to give you this one final opportunity, and you may have said everything, but if there's something right now that you feel um, that is important to say, whether concerning this topic or not, what we've had in this whole discussion here, I want to give you that opportunity to share anything. And again, you may not have anything, but if you do, I want to give you that opportunity to have any final thoughts. Yes, thank you. Very simply this, to each one watching, seize the moment. We're living in a unique time in human history. The goal is not to survive. The goal is to thrive. It's like when someone has a heart attack because they haven't been living rightly for years. It's a wake up call. And the goal is not to survive the heart attack, but to develop a new healthy lifestyle. This is the hour for us to seek God like we've never sought him before for us to get hold of God in a fresh new way in our lives, to become his vessels and his vehicles in a dying and confused and lost world. The world is hurting. We have the answer. To the extent Jesus is glorified in our own eyes, we can make him glorious to others. Seize the moment and seek his face. I love it. Again, Dr. Brown, thank you so much for being a part of this episode. I sincerely appreciate your time and honor the work that you're doing for the kingdom. For everybody else, thank you so much for listening. I pray that this episode has encouraged you, it has equipped you, and it has challenged you in advancing the kingdom of God. Until the next episode, guys, we love you and we bless you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for listening to the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast. It is our prayer that this episode challenged you, encouraged you, and equipped you for the advancement of the kingdom of God. For more episodes or ways that you can partner with Ryan Johnson Ministries, please go to www.ryanjohnson.us or email us directly at info at ryanjohnson.us. Please join us again soon for another episode of the Blacksmith Chronicles.